As we've been following along the story of Jesus and the New Testament, uh, we went through the 40 days following the resurrection in which Jesus walked and talked with his disciples. He appeared to them. He showed himself, it says, by many infallible proofs to be alive. And it says that he taught them about the kingdom of God for 40 days. And then something happens after the 40 days that really isn't talked about as much. We, we talk about the death of Christ. We talk about his resurrection. And then it's kind of like the end of the story. We, we kind of trail off from there. And then there's this addendum that's called the ascension. When Jesus went back up to heaven. And it's not really discussed as a, a major theological thing. A major event that we point to in the life of Christ. But as I was studying it this week, it, it really is the thing that is the connecting piece that helps us understand the answer to the question, what is Jesus doing right now? Have you ever thought about that question? I mean, if, we're, if we really go in our minds, somehow we think of Jesus as having come here to the earth for three years, and then he died and resurrected, and then we don't really know what to do with him after that. We don't... We don't really know what to pl where to place him. We think, okay, he's in heaven doing something, but what is he doing? And the ascension is the, the connecting point for us between then and now. What is Jesus' connection to us right now? What is he doing up there in heaven? And the ascension speaks to that, and so would you turn with me to two places, if you could hold them together, Luke chapter 24 and Acts chapter 1. Both of them written by Luke, who came to faith somewhere during the missionary journeys of Paul, most likely. It's very likely that the Apostle Paul actually was the one who brought Luke to Christ. We don't know exactly how that come, came to be, but there's some clues in the book of Acts that kind of lead us that direction. And Luke was a companion of the Apostle Paul from that time. And he wrote two volumes to a man named Theophilus. In which he says he wanted to write an orderly account of the things that happened from the beginning of Jesus' when he was born, actually, until the time in which Paul was wrapping up his missionary journeys and facing a Roman trial. And so we have volume one, which is the Gospel of Luke, and volume two, which is the book of Acts. And Luke seems to connect the two volumes by this thing called the Ascension of Jesus. He ends his Gospel with that, and then he begins the book of Acts with it. And so there we turn to Luke chapter 24. Starting in verse 50, we read, When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Turn with me over to Acts chapter 1. And let's just go ahead and start in the beginning. Where again Luke tells us, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And those are the two accounts that we have of the ascension, both given by Luke and curiously not mentioned by any of the other gospel writers. And I find three things, if you're following along in your outlines, that we can learn from the ascension. And the first word is preparation. You see, it, we tend, as I said, to have Jesus die on the cross, three days later to rise from the dead, and then we kind of trail off. You know, what, what happens after that? But we find this curious period of 40 days in between the resurrection and his ascension. Jesus had accomplished, he said on the cross, it is finished. I have paid for everything that I have come to purchase. I have died for the sins of the world. And when he rose from the dead, he provided life because he rose so we too can have life in his name. But it seems as if he wasn't done yet. It seems that there was something that was still lacking, that he had 40 days that he needed to instill in his disciples. We see all throughout the ministry of Jesus that the disciples were just not really getting it. He would give a teaching, he would say something, even about what was going to happen. He said all these things were going to happen, trying to prepare them, but they they didn't quite have it sink in. It didn't quite grasp it. And so we're told that for 40 days, Jesus spent that time with his disciples, appearing in various times and teaching them. But Jesus' ascension, his departure, was not a surprise. We find at various times that he would mention it, that he was going to leave. That at some point he was going to have to die, he was going to rise from the dead, and then he was going to leave. And he even went so far as to tell his disciples that if he left, it would be better for them. We find one of these accounts in Luke chapter 9, in the transfiguration of Jesus. Where it says that Jesus took a couple of his disciples up on a hill... And it says that they saw his glory, and he was shining bright. And two figures appear there up on the mountain, Moses and Elijah. And we're told that two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. And I thought a little bit about this encounter. And the word for departure is actually exodus. And I thought about who is there with him. Moses and Elijah. That would have been a conversation. Moses could have talked about his exodus. Hey, you remember, you know, back when, when God called me to go before Pharaoh and lead the, the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage? He also had an exodus that had to do with his death. As the Israelites got to the border of the promised land after the 40 years of wandering, uh, Moses had made a a fatal error in misrepresenting God. And God said, well, I'm sorry, Moses, but you're not going to be able to go in to the promised land. But here's what I'll do. I'll take you up to the top of the mountain and you can see it. And then after he saw it, he died. 
But before he died, God had brought along another young man. And God said, it's time to transfer it over. And Elijah, he had a very mysterious thing happen in his death. As he was walking around with his other protege, Elisha, the day came where Elijah knew that he was going to be taken up into the sky. And Elisha was standing there and he says, can you give me a double portion of your spirit when you go? A very odd request. But Elijah said, well, I will pray to God and if my mantle falls down to you, you will know that it has been granted. And so Elisha standing there and watches his master, Elijah, go flying in. He says, Master, the chariots of heaven. What a sight that must have been. So here's Moses and Elijah talking about their departure. And as I really thought about it, I, I saw this theme of the departure. And I thought about the Apostle Paul. In 2 Timothy, he knew that his time was coming short. He said, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. As he's passing on his knowledge to his protege, his son in the faith, Timothy. In 2 Peter, Peter also knows that his time is coming soon. And he says, I will make every effort to see that after my departure, my exodus, you will always be able to remember these things. There seems to be a necessity for those who are in ministry, those who, those who, and all of us, by the way, are in ministry. We may not just realize it or not. But a sense that Jesus had, that he knew from the moment he was born, that as he was growing up and his ministry started, he knew that there was going to be an ending point. He knew that when he came, he was going to go. And God is always faithful. And so Jesus knew that he had some work to do. He had something to instill and to leave with the disciples. And so it says for 40 days he was teaching them about the kingdom of God. God's rule and reign. Now we can talk about God as the creator of the universe. And so he reigns over the heavens and the earth. But not quite in the same way as he rules in your heart and in mine, if we have surrendered our lives over to him. Technically, he has the rights to the earth, but he hasn't capitalized on all of them as of yet. And so he taught about the reign of God. He taught them about the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Jesus, as he was preparing for his departure, he talked to his disciples about the Holy Spirit, this comforter, another comforter, just like him who would come, except the difference would be, Jesus said, I've been with you for this time, but the Holy Spirit shall come and be in you. And something is going to happen, Jesus says, when he comes in you. And this is where he gives them their mission, their task, which must have been such a monumental task. If you think about it, at this point, that you had the followers of Jesus, but basically, Jesus had devoted himself to 12 men, one of whom he knew was going to betray him and leave. And so you have 11 men, in which Jesus says, you're going to go into all the earth and preach my gospel. Tell people about me. And I would imagine they were asking the same question that we often ask. How are we going to do that? And Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And as in the coming weeks, as we go through the book of Acts, we'll find that this is almost like an outline of, to the book. 
of how the Holy Spirit, how God had orchestrated that the gospel would start in Jerusalem and start spreading out to Judea and Samaria and then finally to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus had teaching to do to his, for his disciples before he was ready to leave. But there's also the blessing that he left them with. In Luke chapter 24, it says, When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. The final picture that these men had of Jesus was of him with his arms raised, blessing them. And if we could only picture Jesus in that way, that he is standing over us, blessing us, saying, I have a task for you to do. I have a purpose. I, I'm sending my Holy Spirit to give you power. And I hand my authority over to you to preach my word, to tell people about who I am. But as he does, he blesses us. And as in Matthew's gospel, he says that I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. And so the final picture that they have of him as he goes up into heaven was blessing. But then, lastly, he had to give them closure. Now, some of us have experienced this in our lives. There's, there's a need for closure when somebody is leaving, when some transition is happening in our lives. We all seem to need closure. And when we don't get it, there seems to be something lacking. And our brain seems to play tricks on us. You know, well, maybe it didn't really happen. Maybe it was just a dream. Well, maybe that person will come back. But what Jesus did is he gave them closure. They saw him go up. They saw him leave. And then beyond that, it says, two men, we believe them to be angels, said, why are you still looking up in the sky? He's gone. He will come back. But until he does, go and do what he has called you to do. Could you imagine what it would have been like had Jesus just kind of appeared now and then, and so he, he appears one week, and then two weeks later he appears to them for a little bit, and then he doesn't appear for a little bit. The disciples probably would have been left to think, like, well, well I don't know, is he coming back? It's been a little while, but uh, it was a couple of weeks since the last time he showed up. I, I think that this was a necessary thing for them to really understand that things had changed. That the Jesus that they had walked and talked with and come to know as their master, their friend, that he really was going back to his Father in heaven. He wasn't leaving us alone, but he was going back. He was going to be gone. And so there was some kind of preparation that was left. But it's also the presence the ascension tells us that the answer to the question, what is Jesus doing now? And one thing that he told his disciples was he was preparing our place. He said, I'm going to go back to my father and I go to prepare a place for you so that you may be with me wherever it is that I am going. And I will come back for you when your place has ready. In the book of Hebrews, we're told that Jesus is our high priest and our counselor. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. 
Jesus, we're told, he ascended to the right hand of God. And there he is as our great high priest. He is the mediator, the one mediator between God and man. And when we pray, we often pray in our weakness. We often pray confessing our sins. We often pray asking God to fill that which is lacking in our lives, in the lives of, that are of those around us. And Jesus stands as a high priest who is not numb to our circumstances. He stands as one who was tempted in every way and yet without sin. He understands what it is to be tempted. He understands what it is to undergo physical pain. He understands what it is to be in need emotionally. And that's why he's called a comforter. And we can find and receive mercy and grace in our time of need. Because Jesus is our counselor. And the other thing that this means is that when the devil, who's called the accuser, comes and says, have you seen what this person has done? And he slanders us before the throne of God. There is Jesus who says, yeah, well, they did it. That's true. But I died for them. And they're forgiven. So you leave them alone. He stands as our mediator, our great high priest before, between us and God. But even more than that, Jesus didn't just go up into heaven to stay there until the second coming. The, the miraculous thing is that he dwells within every single one of us who have submitted to his leading in our life. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul tells us, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. You see, Christ isn't off in just a, a far distant place. He didn't just go back to heaven and wait for a while until it was time to come back. He says, I will send you another comforter just like myself. And we tend to think of that as just the Holy Spirit. But the miraculous thing is that the God of the universe, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwell inside of each one of us who are followers of Jesus Christ. And when it says that he who gave life to Jesus' dead body wants to give life to you, that's not talking about a far distant event. It's not just talking about when we die. It's not just talking about when Jesus comes back. It's not just talking about when we go to heaven. It's talking about right now. The moment that we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, we are said to have died with Christ. And we no longer live, Paul says, but Christ lives in us. The life which you now see me live on in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself up for me. And everything that God commands us to do, everything that he commissions us to do, he gives us himself, his life, his peace, his love, his boldness. We have Christ living in us. Well, the third P word for today is perusia. And the perusia is the word that's associated with the second coming of Christ. You see, in Acts chapter 1, we read, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men, dressed in white, stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The ascension not only points us to what Jesus is doing now, but it points us towards his second coming. 
He'll come back in the same way, the angel said. Well, if you think about it just from a practical standpoint, he left from the Mount of Olives and he says he'll come back on the Mount of Olives. It says that he was received into the clouds and it says he'll be coming back with the clouds. It says that they watched him go up into heaven and then it says every eye will see him when he comes back. And so in a very real way, they were saying, you saw him go up, you'll see him come down one day. And so the ascension of Jesus points us to the second coming of Christ. And it asks us the question, are we ready? That's always the question that is asked in Scripture. But notice the question that the disciples asked in, in Acts chapter 1. Right before Jesus goes, they're asking, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses. He kind of took their question about detail. The kind of questions we ask about the second coming. You know, when's it going to happen? Is it going to be before the tribulation or after the tribulation? We want to know all these little subtle details. How is it going to happen? I remember when people were getting all upset when the Left Behind movies came out because when the rapture happened, it showed everybody's clothes still here. And they were like, that's not how it's going to happen. Our clothes are going to go with us. And I'm thinking, where does it say either? And what does it matter? You know, it's fun to think about, you know, when the rapture happens. If it does happen before the tribulation, there's going to be a whole lot of chaos that happens as a result of that. There's a whole lot of people who are going to be missing all of a sudden who were in very important places at the time. But that's the kind of questions that we want to ask Jesus about a second coming. But notice what he did. They asked the question about detail and about timing, and he says, okay, well, you don't need to worry about that, but here's your purpose. Here's what you should be focusing on. You go out, and you be my witnesses. I'll give you the Holy Spirit. I'll give you the power. I'll give you the authority. You go out and be my witnesses. That's what I want you to do. That's what I want you to focus on. And then he left. But his second coming, his ascension, also points us to how we'll go. In 1 Thessalonians 4, the Apostle Paul tells us, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And again, we have these elements of the clouds. We have the, you know, going up and being caught up into the air. But again, the question that's always asked in relation to the second coming of Jesus in the rapture, it's always, are you ready? You see, this reality, and just thinking about this event, that there's going to be a group of people who are going to be alive when Jesus comes back. And those group of people are going to be caught up just the way, same way that Jesus was. Perhaps with some tweaks and differences. But does that thought, it either terrifies you or it excites you. And if you like roller coasters, it might excite you. But I don't think it's the type of thing that's like that. I don't think we're going to feel and see and go, oh my gosh, I'm way up high. <laughs> it says, in a twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. We will be made like him, and we shall see him as he is. But the question that's always asked as Peter puts it, those who have this hope in them purify themselves so that they may be found blameless and spotless and they may not be found ashamed when he comes. And that's the question that's left with us. 
the ascension, it tells us what Jesus is doing now. It tells us what we should be doing now. And it tells us, and asks us a very real question. Are we ready for him to come back? And that's the questions that we must ponder as we leave here today. Amen? Amen.